Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where my awesome co host, epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens, and I speak with people from all walks of the publishing industry. Lurking for Legends is live, as you guys can see, and it's interactive. So we encourage all of you viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what you hear in the show. So tonight we have Con Lavery dark fantasy, horror, and thriller author, all dark stuff though, um, artist and web designer. So welcome, Khan. How are you tonight? Good. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, welcome, Khan. It's, it's nice to have you. It's so great to have you here. There's like with you, there is so much to talk about. It's going to be tough to keep it to 40 minutes, but <laughs> we'll give it a shot anyway. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first? Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, my graphic designer by trade and I've been doing that for just over a decade now and freelancing for seven years as a web designer and graphic designer and uh, uh, branding expert. So people hire me for a range of things and then a writer by passion. So a lot of the stuff I do with the graphic design helps fund the books because uh, most of my stuff has been self-publishing. So you have to hire editors and pay for promo and stuff. So I write everywhere, as you mentioned, from fantasy, thrillers and horrors, all the creepy stuff. Um, and all of it seems to fall under those categories. That's cool. And so tell us, let's just start with um, your your latest book, Rave. I mean, you have a lot of books out there. And if anyone wants to check out Khan's site, he has like the macrocosm, which we'll probably talk about later as well, to show you all of the works in his world but just for the moment tell us about your latest one rave yeah yeah the latest one is rave which is a canadian-based horror novel uh it takes place between british columbia and alberta and it happened to be one of the most difficult books i'd written next to the fantasy series but as a, as a standalone book it was the most challenging because it tackled a bunch of themes i wasn't quite familiar with doing before, um, such as like love triangles, which I hadn't done a lot of before and making a plot realistic, but still keeping that horror aspect. So it doesn't just fall into a um, action thriller, which I was getting kind of cool. close to. So it was uh, combining all of that. And basically the whole story is about in the late nineties, kids in Prince George are going to the super underground rave. And at the time raves were illegal. So they weren't, they didn't have sponsors or anything. So it was super hush hush. No one talks about it. If you do the cops bust it and that happens in the book without spoiling too much. And uh, a friend ends up dead. So they end up having to figure out how to get out of this because the cops think they did it and there's a killer on the loose. And that's pretty much the whole premise of rave. That's awesome. Con, I just uh, think you should move just a bit to your right. I think we're just cutting your face off just a wee bit. There, that's better. Yeah, maybe. There you go. Okay. That's better, yeah. I don't want to do the full forty-five minutes with just half your face. No. <laughs> I gotta go, oh my goodness. So, no, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, so that book released in May seventh. Was it May seventeenth last this year? Uh, I think so. Somewhere sure, around there. Uh, reading on your website. Yeah. For, so, how is it being received by your fans? So far, good. It. Uh, I had a number of advanced reviewers go through it. I had submitted to some review sites and some YouTubers, they're going through it. And uh, yeah, everyone seems to be enjoying it and they have great things to say about it. Like it's fast paced and uh, it's actually the first book, full book that I brought out that's been in all present tense. So that's been a change from the previous wow. writing where I've all done past tense. And uh, I think so far I've actually enjoyed that type of writing more, which will most of the new stuff will probably migrate that way. and. Uh, fans seem to enjoy the change. So the present tense is done from a, a eye point of view. Uh, kind of like um, point of view? it's it is third person, but being the present tense where it's it's saying oh, really? like uh, yeah, like says. So like uh, the main character's name is Seth, so he'll be like, "Hey guys, Seth says," and then so it's always using that active present voice rather than said or screeched. It's screech. And so it was, yeah, it was a real change in head space. Cause like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would yeah be I know. No, go ahead, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. well, Chrissy, did you edit this or is this, uh, is Con one of your clients is editing? I'm just thinking that might no, be a editor editor. as well if you're not used to it. 
Yeah. No, this, uh, no. One is, this, is, no, this is a different editor. Robin, right? Her name is Robin, I think. Robin, yeah, yeah. She, I happen to meet her through a mutual friend. So they're just blind luck. And we've worked together for many years. And she saw the change too and thought it was a nice adjustment from what I'd done previously. So uh, yeah, I've been working with her for a long time. And she's grown as an editor and has shifted her focus. And I've changed as a writer. So my needs are different. And they've always seemed to kind of line up, which is nice. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do want to comment on the present tense, writing in the present tense. Um, I, I think, did you find it, first of all, did you find it easier or difficult to kind of adjust to? But also, I, I know that a lot of, and this is the opposite, a lot of romance writers write in present tense because it's like you're there with the, the character. Is that kind of what you're aiming for in horror as well? Uh, yeah, 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 no, I, pretty much. And because uh, there is a there's actually a big romance element to it. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I didn't I didn't know romance authors did that because I don't read romance. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I wanted them to really be there in the moment with the characters and connect with them. And an, an issue with that book from an earlier draft was uh, originally I just wanted to make a Canadian slasher in the spirit of old slashers where you have these iconic killers and everyone just falls in love with the killer and they forget about the main characters and the earlier draft really fell with that and it was written in the present or the past tense so i did a massive overhaul wow. after i'd written some short stories one i think is coming out it might be coming out this month it was the first short story i had written um in present tense and it was a real real twist of the brain but then eventually something clicked after going through this short story enough times i was like i get it i can do present tense and uh decided to just overhaul the entire book and write it in present tense to make people really be with the the protagonist that's interesting it sounds like a lot of work once you get the book written and you gotta redo it again but uh as yeah. long as you're happy with the outcome at the end that's perfect Definitely. And Anita is saying, yeah, present tense can be tricky. I write some flash fiction in present tense. Yeah. yeah I feel like it's one of those things that either the spirit takes you or it doesn't <laughs> almost. Yeah. And it doesn't always work with a story. Like if you want, if you're having, yeah, like if you've got a character, um, actually, you don't remember the author's name. It's a book called The Contortionist that I read. Really good. And the whole premise is about this guy who um, makes fake IDs and starts he sells them to people to start new lives and he gets busted by the cops and he's telling them his stories. So it had to be in the past tense because present tense wouldn't work. So it doesn't always work in certain books. That's interesting. That's a great point. Yeah. So I was looking on your website uh, before I come on here and I was really, uh, enamored actually I've, I've spent a lot of time and it. it's neat that you can actually hit plus and you can bring the picture up bigger because it's hard to see at the beginning because you have so many books in what is and i'm going to screw this word up is what is you call a macrocosm is that correct macrocosm yeah, yeah. macrocosm what, what exactly is a macrocosm i never heard that word before yeah it's it's a fancy word for the world <laughs> just putting everything into the world so instead of a, a micro macro is large and cosm is encompassing so it's, uh, I found, I don't know how I found out about the word. It was, I was reading it on Wikipedia <laughs> and I was like, that's the word. Cause even from way, way back when I first started writing, I always knew everything was going to be in some superverse, and I didn't have a name for it. Didn't know what I was going to call it. Um, so eventually the name came, which lined up nicely for when the short story collection was ready to go because the short story collection acts as the glue for the whole story otherwise each book is very independent with a few hints every now and then like a guest character or mm -hmm. a guest uh or a teaser to a particular item or something that exists in the world so they're they've been loosely connected um and the macrocosm was seemed to fit where it was vague enough and still gave freedom to write anything without it being kind of locked in like star wars is kind of locked in because it's stars and wars so there's generally batter battles and stuff and uh that's fine because that's star wars <laughs> and they're doing well <laughs> so, so with them mm -hmm. uh, no, no, sorry i was just gonna expand on this macrocosm before we move on uh so 
Uh, now, we talked about this before we went on air. I don't write linearly, so I don't write chronologically. I wrote my first series, and everything I've written since then has always been backwards. So my readers are probably wondering what the heck's going on with my timeline. Do you write chronologically, or do you bounce all over your macrocosm? Oh, yeah, all over the place. The actually got I got them here. The very, very, very first one was uh, that one, the fantasy book. And that kind of jump started me into the writing and thought I wanted to just write fantasy. But as I continued to write, I had more interests. And then I wrote Seed Me, which is the Edmonton based horror one. And after that, I wrote Yegman, which was a prequel in a way to seed me. So I've kind of jumped all over the place without any rhyme or reason. And then rave takes place in the nineties. So it's even further back, but then I've done short stories that take place in the sci-fi aspect of the world where there's no actual novels yet, but eventually one day I'd love to write a sci-fi. So then like if somebody were to go to your site and they wanted to start reading your books and they weren't sure exactly where to start, would you say that they should start at the very beginning of the macrocosm or would you say it doesn't really matter? They can start wherever they want. Pretty much wherever they want, like whatever they enjoy reading. And if they just want to encompass the whole macrocosm, uh, the short story collection would be a good fit because uh, there's a character who is was inspired by the Cheshire cat and he what he's in the fantasy series and he helps the main character in the short story collection figure out how they died so they witness other lives and try to figure out okay what happened to you because they lost their memory the the protagonist so you you get an overarching story where this uh, this character helps the main protagonist uh, understand what happened in the world like oh here's the fantasy world and then eventually this is why it withered away into the modern days and what happened after that led to the sci-fi and the technological advancements so that's a good one and it's a good mix of genres if they want to wrap their head around the whole uh story arc that's a great suggestion and yeah mm -hmm. yeah we can I say was, something Richard. Yeah, I, I wonder so you got so many books in this all encompassing universe now I have to ask you because I know what I am and I think Christy's the same as I'm a pantser I fly by the seat of my pants for the most part I've developed having an excel spreadsheet and I put notes mm. and stuff in it now just to spur my memory out the way uh, uh, Lorena has blue eyes and you know three three four books later uh, Lorena pops back in the book and she's what color eyes so instead of looking at my manuscript I just go to excel spreadsheet with so much things going on in your universe are you a plotter? Like, do you have sticky notes all over the house, or how do you how do you handle that? Uh, I've I've done all of all of them. Like, I've done pantsing, plotting, and fusion, like half plotting, where I just do a one pager, and it really has been all over the map. And lately, uh, I've moved back to pantsing, and it just feels more in intuitive right now, uh, where plotting felt more in line where with where I was at with writing and now I'm I'm really having a lot more fun doing that and I think mm -hmm. the stories are better for it um and for the keeping track of everything that is a tough one and I know yeah I I used to have to flip through the books to try and find stuff mm -hmm. and eventually I I just uh ended up making a section on the site that's uh, a wiki and I I read an article where authors had done it as a little private website for themselves. And I was like, that's a great idea. So I thought mm -hmm. I'd do it and I, I made it public. So any super fan that wanted to get real nerdy and go down a rabbit hole, they can go to this Wikipedia that's on my site and drill into every character, every, every location, time, era, and item. And it references what book they're in, um, any stats, like if they had green eyes, um, if they're a fantasy creature, if they're in the future in sci-fi and uh, the Wikipedia will also do the auto linking, like the actual Wikipedia site. Mm. So it connects anything if you mention anything. So if a character had a particular sword and that sword's in the wiki, it auto links it. So it not only helps super nerds that want to get into stuff, it helps me when I'm trying to remember what the hell I did. <laughs> That's awesome. That's such a good idea. I love that. That's so mm. smart. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's uh, gotten easier to do these wikis because you can 
um, most most sites these days are built in a platform called WordPress, and you can get extensions that include all in one wikis. And I found one of those and just installed it and then spent a lot of time updating and submitting all these entries because you have to write it all. So it's a uh, mm -hmm. that's where the time gets taken up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I've got a simple wiki on my site. It's uh, just uh, four of the main characters in each of my books, but I'd, I'd like to expand it to, like you say, to include the weapons and everything else for, for the super uh, fans that are right into your stuff and they just have to know everything in the background. They probably know the books better than you do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just uh, looking at a thing here. We get a couple of comments coming in. Uh, JD Estrada is sitting down for dinner. Just wanted to say hello. A couple of questions. Is your first Star Trek movie Wrath of Khan? <laughs> your favorite one. And would you ever work on graphic novels, graphic work, randomness, inspiration? No one would suspect. Ooh, I think it was my first Star Trek movie. It's either that or. Yeah, no, actually, it would be that one. Yeah, that would be the first one if memory serves correctly. But uh, I've seen a lot of them and. Uh, yeah, they're all they're all fun. So, and yes, my parents named me after Khan from Star Trek. <laughs> oh, really? Cool. I didn't yeah. know I put that together until you actually just said that. Even though I just read the Wrath of Khan. Yeah. And that Khan's not spelled the way it is on Star Trek. No, they gave it a little bit of a different spelling to give it uh, some ambiguity, but uh, it's yeah, it's still there. <laughs> I still get yelled down the street by my name. <laughs> You're not into these big bugs with <laughs> little claws on the front, are you? No, nope. okay. <laughs> it's in my ear. <laughs> so, I don't. JD no super asked, strength. Uh, would you ever work on a graphic novel? I know, I know you do a lot of graphic work. So is that something that's in plans for your macrochasm? Yeah, I've always wanted to. Like, um, I'll pull up Rave again. Like, I've done a lot of, I do the graphic design and I've moved into recently what's known as photo illustration. So, like, here is one of the illustrations within Rave. So they're all done with photos, but then painted over top of. The fantasy series has line work. So I, I've done a lot of book illustrations, and I've actually done some maps for author clients. And it's a lot of work. So I would like to do a, a graphic novel or a comic, but it really just comes down to the amount of time. Uh, it takes to do everything. Mm -hmm. And then if you include audiobooks and then you've got your print books and the ebooks and then marketing. And uh, if you have other work you need to take care of and want a life still. So uh, one day maybe, but not today. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I can just imagine what it'd be like to do a graphic novel and all the work that goes into a picture. And uh, his last question was, uh, what's the randomness inspiration that no one would suspect? Random inspiration. Um Random mist. <laughs> What's the random. bizarre inspiration you had for your books? Uh, just doing nothing, I have to say, is the most random because you could just be sitting outside or you could be sitting anywhere eating breakfast or driving the car and just you just get a random inspiration. I find those tend to be the biggest aha moments. It's when you finally manage to silent your brain from other ideas or or anything and uh it just hits your head and it's like i think that's where it's trusting the trusting time and the process help because uh yeah you, sometimes you just get sparked with an idea so how would you handle that in a car i, I remember when i used to work <laughs> I, I would get my inspirations when i was on my drive to work and you know by the time i got home i'd totally forgotten them and they were great ideas but i couldn't remember them like did you, yeah. have, do you have some way to write oh. them down no i just hope they stay in my head <laughs> <laughs> Just Not like always. repeating them like a crazy person, you're alone in the car and you're like, I hope they think that I have a Bluetooth on because I'm just gonna keep saying this over and over until I don't want to forget, you know. So yeah, yeah. same thing. Windows frost up so we can write it on the window with our finger. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There, there we go. That's a good one. <laughs> That's great. Uh, David Kelly is uh, bringing up a great point. He's saying, Khan, I noticed you have a Patreon, and I want to give you a chance to talk about that too, Khan, because I know you added a new level recently. And he asks, yeah. do you find it hard writing things monthly? I would struggle with that. Yeah, it uh, certainly has been. Uh, that's actually where the short story collection came from. It started out um, as monthly 
short stories I did on my blog as more of a mental exercise, and I really didn't care who read them or who paid attention to them. Uh, some were good, some weren't, and they needed a lot of love, and they allowed me to experiment and play. So like, even if I wasn't working on a book or something, if I just, instead of trying to commit to writing once a day at the time, I was like, you know, if I could just write one thing a month and just see where it goes. And I didn't, I liked a lot, but I didn't like all of the stories. So I just kept doing it. And then uh, after a couple of years, I had enough to put together as a collection. And when you spend two years away from a story and come back and look at it with fresh eyes, it's like, oh, that's what was, what was wrong with it. I'll just overhaul all of this and fix that. So after doing that for two years, I was realized I like, oh, I, I can still do this. I did it for 24 months. So I could probably keep doing one short story a month, but um, see if people would be interested because they gained more traction over the years as I kept doing it. So I thought I'd convert it to Patreon and see uh, who'd be interested. Yeah, and you have a, a new level there too at $1.50, right? Yeah, yeah, and that gives all the other perks where like the the other, the first tier was the $5 tier, which gave you the monthly short story and written and audio, and you got the artwork uh, to download. And the lower tier gets you all the other perks, like I'll do updates there, or I'll give exclusive chapters or early access interviews to other authors so that people can learn about their work. And um, yeah, basically extras that accompany the regular subscription just without the short story. So it's those I want to show support um, without the five bucks. Have you found that um, writing short stories more regularly like uh, helps you make your own work more succinct if that was a problem at all before? Big time. It, it has taught a lot about writing the whole bit above like about pacing and understanding characters and plots because you're trying to do it in such a short amount of time. And before, for most of the, the free ones that I did for two years, most of them sat around 2,000 words. And then some of them were like two-parters. But 2,000 words, see if I could do it. Because uh, I know a lot of writers, and even I did at the time, we were like struggling with word counts. And I was like, eh, I don't know. So I, I was like, I'll do 2,000. And there was a lot of filler that wasn't needed. <laughs> and uh, eventually I scrapped a lot of that stuff and cleaned it up. And in the newer ones, I experiment further where it's like, can I do a thousand word short story and still have the same impact with the same pacing? And then others, it's like, I'll do a 4,000 word. So it, uh, yeah, it's given me still lots of room to play and grow and try different writing styles as well, like first person or uh, write a journal entry or write a, um, yeah, character telling you the story instead, stuff like that. It gives you a lot more room for play, I think, you know, when you're doing your, uh, the works that you, I mean, the short stories are serious too, but like, I, I don't know, I always think of a novel as like the serious work, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, Same. Yeah, yeah, it does give you a lot more to like, sort of choose from in your arsenal and just a broader sense of how to tell the story best, I guess. Yeah, and another nice thing about it is like with this whole macrocosm thing, some some things just don't quite work as a full book, but they're such key elements to the overall arc, but they aren't important to individual books. So like um, telling about what happened between the modern world and the sci-fi, that, that didn't, there's details that don't quite work to be a full novel, but I could tell it in like three short stories and then you get to learn like, oh, that's why the world fell apart. <laughs> that's awesome. You, you were talking about audio on your, uh, when you do your Patreon, and I noticed you do your own audio books. And for anyone who doesn't know, that, uh, that blank disc in front of Khan is actually an audio microphone. It's a special microphone that's, uh, and you were telling me all the neat perks and stuff it does. Uh, so you do your own audio books, all of your own audio books. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, that was one I started in September during uh, here in Alberta. We had lots of the lockdowns for COVID. So I just decided to try something new. I needed a break from writing and uh, I have dabbled in music quite a bit. So I know a little bit about recording and I have just to my side here, a bunch of 
synths and bass guitar and percussion so and I have the microphones um because I yeah played around with music and I was like oh I should try doing an audiobook and see where that goes and uh at first they were released as weekly episodic um series so I'd take Wait, a book I'm that was asking about that episodic too we'll do that after you yeah yeah so it um there's I started with the first book seed me as a series once a week, because uh, it takes time to record it. And it was a whole new skill mm -hmm. learning about a different type of pacing and pausing because you're presenting and you're not quite acting because you're, at least I'm not an actor, so I can't <laughs> do voice acting, but I could emphasize certain things and change, just adjust a slight tone or pitch to clarify who's talking. And uh, yeah, it was took about three books, but I think I finally learned how to do it. <laughs> You were mentioning too that the, that microphone is something about your equipment there that takes out oh. the P e and the B, like the, the popping you were saying. Yeah, that's, really cool. that, that's this thing. Uh, it is, known, yeah, it's known as a pop depopper, and uh, I think it was like 15 bucks. And it's got a little attachment at the bottom, so yeah, so you can actually put it on any mic stand and it cleans up yeah the, the p's the b's inhales or lip smacking right. noises all the annoying stuff <laughs> it just it, it clears <laughs> sure. them out <laughs> you don't realize how much of that you do until you try to record something like this <laughs> it just gets cringy and you're just like oh god <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah it's okay if you're reading them for your kids but if you're putting it out professionally and you want people to buy them you, you want it to sound a little professional and yes. that's awesome that you do your own and you release them on spotify do you have do you have them on other platforms as well like do you have your novels on big platforms and then the episodic part on Spotify, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the they they all started on Spot or well, yeah, Anchor, which is owned by Spotify, but they distribute to iTunes and uh, Google Podcasts, basically a bunch of podcast platforms. So they're episodic on there. And then I clean them up, fix any little tweaks or anything. So they're kind of the rough versions, the free one. And then the cleaned up final versions, I throw on Audible and all the other distributors uh, through Find a Way, I believe, or Find mm -hmm. My Voice, and they I will know, distribute. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they'll distribute to all the others like Kobo, Walmart, Google, uh, Apple, and then uh, yeah, yeah, and it works out great. Awesome. So David's saying his COVID mask would be a depopper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, they they actually work well. The masks. <laughs> <laughs> That's, funny. That's great. So you've you've also mentioned um, that you well actually I don't remember if you mentioned it that you do web design as well. Yeah, you did at the very beginning. You mentioned you do yeah. web design as well, and you did my site, which um, Amber is saying I saw Chrissy's new website that Khan designed. He's outstanding. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, before I worked with Khan, I had nothing but bad experiences to be honest with you with web designers, and then I started working with Khan, and you know I mean I don't have any kind of affiliate sponsorship with him or anything like that but he's brilliant like he's so much easier to work with than anybody else and he works really fast so if you guys are looking for somebody to work on your site i would highly recommend con but um how do you uh how do you manage your time because like i have a list of the things that I know about that you do and you probably do more than this i mean you're writing short stories at least once a month you have the full length novels that you're writing you have your audiobooks, your recording, you have your web design business, which is, you know, it's a full on business. And then you're also doing art. Like how, how do you manage your time with all that? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's, um, it's cliche saying, but like, uh, it's that saying, uh, a project's never finished. It's just as a due date. So I think I started taking that a lot more to heart and it was my college uh, instructor who had, really kind of set it where it finally hit my head. And then I was like, ah, yeah, no, that's true. Cause then I was going to college for design and we learned all sorts of different processes, uh, the creative process for graphic design and how to do thumb sketches and hammer them out and take them to the next phase to eventually get a final logo design or a poster or something that um, is the final product without like fumbling around and getting lost. You'd, you'd excuse me, you trust the process and, follow that accordingly and you end up getting consistently something that's good rather than listening to the back of your head that's questioning things yeah you, you do that and then i found that really helped manage my time um 
because man, even just in design, a lot of people burn out fast and you can see people come and go in the design industry quite frequently because it can be a very daunting and demanding place because it's kind of art, but it's kind of not because you're still have deliverables to offer someone in a very structured and technical manner, but it also has to be artistic in the sense that a logo has to inspire people. So it it's, it rides this weird line and it can, uh, when people crush your work, that can, that can be a bit much. So you learn to handle criticism, handle time. So I think a lot of it I owed going to graphic design school and then learning how to manage projects that can only spend, I don't know, let's say eight hours doing this logo because I'm getting paid X amount of money and my hourly rate is this. So if I do more, I'm probably going to end up hurting myself and losing money. So that kind of mindset kind of helps get everything else done, like the books, where before COVID, I used to do a lot more conventions and I'd sell books in person and sign them. So I, I got, I was really hooked on that once a year convention season. And I was like, I got to get the next book out one way or another. I got to get it out. So somehow I managed to squeeze in the time for that. Yeah, I find it a lot that that's a great answer. It, it is true that like so many other things can contribute to how to manage time and how to how to set your mind, like get get the right mindset so that you, you know, get things done the way you want them to. I used to be a project manager and I totally understand everything you just said about yeah, yeah. you know design and the phases and, and like pacing yourself and how all that works. So that that is a great way to be able to apply that stuff. So we have a really nice comment from Amber who says, oh yeah, once my book is ready for launch, I'm definitely calling Connor for the website. No question there. You will be in good cool. hands, Amber, I promise you. <laughs> really good yeah, hands. Look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. And then we have a question from Wanda. Welcome, Wanda. Uh, where do you get ideas for your books and stories? Are any of your characters inspired by any Canadian serial killers specifically? Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, ideas come from everywhere. They can be watching a movie. They could be friend that could be myself that could be watching the news just sitting there other times they don't even form until you start writing and working on the book itself so it's just yeah osmosis through everything in life and uh i you know no no canadian killer has actually inspired me um actually i don't think any killer has real killer has inspired me. I always find them so horrifying. <laughs> and then I end up writing about these killers that do horrific things. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, more so the characters end up being created or inspired by a certain trait that's either um, needed to be related to the protagonist or someone I actually just know is like, that's a funny trait. But then you pull that trait into its own and then you build a character around that trait that's entirely separate from someone you know that's a great answer richard i'm gonna hog con for a second if you don't mind <laughs> sorry I, I have one more thing if you don't mind i just wanted to say um while we're on the topic of canadian serial killers um i <laughs> noticed that earlier in the interview you were saying um specifically that some of your or maybe all of your books um, are in Canada. And I noticed that's because um, so many horror, not just books, but movies that I watch or watched because I can't handle them anymore, <laughs> um, are in America. And, you know, when you watch Japanese horror, which is some of the scariest I've seen, it's in Japan, but I haven't really seen Canadian. So was that deliberate on your part because Can Canada isn't really represented as much as in horror? Or is it just because you live there? It's a bit of both. I think if I lived somewhere, I'd say the exact same thing. But because I do live in Canada, it, uh, I've, I figured it needs some some representation. And I've probably done a, I've shot myself in the foot probably a little bit because everyone and every everyone thinks in in fiction the world revolves around the states. It's just how it's written. Like aliens always fly and go to the states; they don't go anywhere else. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, yeah, it just seems to how the industries work both in like everywhere when you look, look at Hollywood, you look at uh, the liter literary industry. So maybe one day I'll end up branching out from that, but I wanted to give Canada some some cool stories and make it a creepy place because it's a big place with not a lot of people. So like who's stopping anyone from doing some really messed up stuff because actually they, they have done some messed up stuff <laughs> and it's because uh, there's a lot of open space and it's easy to get forgotten or lost here.
Yeah, that's for sure. And I was I was wondering when I was looking at you did horror that I, I don't write horror at all, but I know as authors, even when you write fiction, even when you write fantasy fiction, you know, there is some research involved. Christy does historical fiction. She's got a ton of research. I don't have to do as much, but there is some I have to do. Writing uh, horror, though, imagine if we did a history search on your computer, we might find some interesting subjects. Uh, I think the police might be involved in the questioning you downtown, but uh, how do you go about researching the horror genre and what types of things would you actually be looking up? Ooh, yeah, it ranges on the horror style, like uh, Seed Me, which was kind of the first horror I did. It was kind of a creature feature, but involved cults, and I really had to design the the creature and learn specifically about plants and their relationship and how they work in nature and um, symbiotic relationships. So I went down this huge biological rabbit hole on learning how animals interact with each other to basically design this creature. And then with Rave, it followed more of a path that I took with my crime thriller, Yegman, where I had to talk with um, people actually interviewed people I knew. And uh, with Rave, I was super lucky where I met a former RCMP officer at a book signing and he agreed to do an interview with me. And I just asked him straight up questions. <laughs> It'd be like, what would you do if you busted an underground rave with a headless body? And he's like, oh, well, one, two, three, four. So I'd be like writing stuff down and learning all of that. And other times research takes you into weird places like, uh, a character in rave ends up in prison so i had to learn about how many years you end up there for manslaughter and i found a whole online dating site for prisoners that are curated by a single person because they can't have access to computers so it just takes you down all sorts of cool places and i'd say the research is the best part of writing a book because you get to meet people and you get to find weird stuff on the internet and uh, go places you wouldn't normally go I'd imagine that you'd maybe end up even coming up with further ideas to apply to other stories once you find some crazy things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just and you save it for later. And it's like, I'm coming back to that one. <laughs> Do you share that on Patreon? <laughs> Ooh, I probably should actually now that I'm actually I'm finally writing something new. So I should probably share some of the cool stuff I find. That would be yeah, interesting. I find that so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I heard Christy talk about what she uh, researches, and it would be an interesting thing for the readers to learn on Patreon because they don't understand what actually goes into the writing of a book. They just think you write, sit down to the computer and type, and you're done. And there's so much stuff that goes behind the scenes. So that'd be, I think your uh, readers would really love to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to do that because, uh, yeah, I've already learned some weird stuff. So <laughs> I'm making note of this. There's no end to it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you touched on Canada being such a big country and we're always in, you know, horror always happens in the States for some bizarre reason, maybe because, you know, that's where everything happens, like Hollywood and all that. And Canada's always perceived as this nice country who's always saying, you know, I'm sorry. So being a Canadian, what or who got you into the horror genre? Uh, it actually was Clive Barker. He was the first one to get me into it. And I'd read some Stephen King. Um and then I used to play a lot of role-playing games where they're not the not the pen and paper ones, but the video game ones. Um, and they they were dense. Like there's so much dialogue and descriptions. This was before games could do intense audio with voice mm -hmm. narration. So you re ended up reading a lot. And um, yeah, I played a lot of those. So and they were all dark and evil, and they weren't your typical fantasy with like more with knights and, and stuff and paladins they were more like you're in hell and you you, you woke up and i have to figure out how you get out of here it's a good good game and uh yeah those those gave me a lot of inspiration and i think that's why i started in the dark fantasy realm but i've always enjoyed horror too and i thought i'd explore more of that and yeah i ended up writing a bit of that that genre too so it uh just creepy things in general tend to inspire me and uh that's where I go with the writing. Cool. I think you have a book in, I, now correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not 100% sure I got this right, but is it the Rutherford Manor series? Is it? Yeah. 
That's, yeah, that's and I one. wanted to understand a little bit more about that. It seemed like, so that's White Hand and that's yours. And is Rutherford Manor though, that is not your series, is that right? You're part of it? Yes, yeah, Rutherford Manor is a uh, much bigger kind of IP that involves other writers and other creative types. And they started out as a haunt actually uh, here in Edmonton. And they have been basically pulling different talents together to put together um, a TV show. They've worked on comics. They've, and uh, yeah, they've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes with that. And um, thankfully I got, I met them actually at a convention. So it's true that you can meet people and network at conventions, which is super handy. And I was promoting another book at the time and uh, I met the creator and his wife and uh, yeah, we chit chatted for a little bit and the conversation evolved into them asking if I want to work on a Rutherford Manor book. And, and then I ended up doing two and an audio book for it. So it's a really cool world. And they did, uh, they, they made some fascinating characters that are super fun to write. And it was a lot of fun adapting them into a story and doing them justice. So then what else would people find if they looked up Rutherford Manor, they find two of your books and then it, it sounds like a lot of other stuff. Is it, it's just books or there's also like, I don't know about movies, but like any kind of online stuff or yeah, what yeah. else is there? Uh, you can find, they did a, a trailer pitch, which is actually right on YouTube and it's, it's super fun. You can find that on their, on their YouTube channel. If you go to their site, you can find the books. Um, they have an album, which is pretty slick. They worked with, uh, a good musician and band. It's Daniel Martin and the infamous. They do like metal, but theatrical. And they did a whole album themed around the series. And, uh, yeah, they, actually once i came on board a lot of stuff ended up getting reworked so it would complement what they were working on with uh the whole universe so yeah you'll mostly find the books the 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 album and the uh the tv show trailer pitch on youtube for now and speaking of albums at your book launch didn't you have uh don't you have an album or some music at least that goes with your current book rave yeah yeah that was a fun collaboration um four yeah there's four of the books i've done have novel scores to go with them because i just i like to dabble in music a big fan of it and a lot of the music themes end up in the books and with rave uh it was the second compilation i put together where i got to work with a number of musicians in uh yeah they are they're all in alberta and they were all really willing to collaborate and uh they did a fantastic job just taking certain scenes and emotions and compiling them into their own stylistic sound and it put together like a full 10 track ep and uh it's got a nice range of styles but yeah they work seamlessly together so it, it's a lot of fun to create that because you see movies have soundtracks especially it was a bigger thing in the 90s where you had like the matrix soundtrack you had the spawn soundtrack and um you see it now too i guess with like tron or black panther and it, it's a great idea. So like, why not books? Why can't books have a score to go with them? I think that's fantastic. And so cool that they, yeah, Alexandra Murray, very cool. I already want to read these. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The idea of music um, that's meant to be, I mean, like a lot of times we have our own music that we listen to when we write or when we read, but then when it's the author's music, that's like meant to go <laughs> with the out with the uh, book, that is even cooler. Yeah, it's, it was a lot of fun and uh, it gets, gets my music itch out because every once in a while I get the idea in my head like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a musician, I'm going to start start a project or something and I'm definitely a writer first and foremost but uh, yeah, then I get my music itch out and then I'm good but uh, it, it's given me the skills to like learn how to record audiobooks and uh, the those audiobooks even have improv music in them too where I can make use of all the music gear I bought and create music to go with each chapter and then put the novel scores together so they're standalone albums that people can can get into and it creates a more cross-pollination when it's uh, a compilation so readers can discover new styles of music and new bands but the bands can also get into reading different stuff wow that's amazing so yeah it's fun yeah, so I see we're getting near the end of the end of our uh, episode. Uh, is there uh, 
what, when's your next book coming out and what is it? Ooh, it's a, that's a kind of a tie. I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be, Ooh, actually I got a few things on the go. <laughs> uh, what's immediately coming out uh, this is the first place I've actually said, it. I'm going to retire two of my books and bring out second editions that are with a fresh edit and they're older ones. So they needed fixing, but either for a brand new book, it might be the sequel to the short story collection, or it might be a brand new urban fantasy novel that starts to bridge the gap between the fantasy world and the modern world. And you get to learn about new characters and you get to see some familiar, um, familiar lore and creatures. Right. So there's nothing uh, solid imminent yet. There's just a, uh, yeah, there's like three drafts that are like in various phases of completion. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah. awesome. There's no definite timeline right now. Yeah. So just check your website. And uh, speaking of your website, where can uh, readers, if they want to buy your books, uh, are you just on Amazon? Are you wide? Where can people find your stuff? Yeah, they are on most of the major providers. You can find uh, the Rutherford Manor series just on Amazon. So uh, they're all there. I think they're on like Kindle exclusive too. And the other ones are on Kobo, Google Play, iBooks, Amazon. You can find them all at conlavery.com, which is K-O-N-N-L-A-V-E-R-Y.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find the um, novel scores there too, uh, the audiobooks, all the links. And then there's a newsletter that uh, if you want to keep updated for when releases are coming out and all the other tidbits that I'm up to. Cool. So signed copies, they can just uh, order them directly through you, through your website? or Ooh, I've got, yeah, I got a page set up for Rave that is not on the main navigation. So it will be <laughs> if you want a signed copy of Rave. And then the others are, are on my ever to-do list <laughs> for signed yeah, copies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> something to do for sure. Yeah. So that was awesome, Con. We really enjoyed having you in here. And it's, it's, you've got such a, an amazing uh, macrocosm new word for me today. So uh, that's, that's great. And I've learned a new thing. And I actually, I want to incorporate uh, that so that my readers can see my, how my books are as well. So I'm glad we had you on here just for that reason. But uh, yeah, th thanks for uh, sharing everything with us. Uh, and hopefully we can get you back on again, maybe next year. And yeah. Talk about uh, what's come out between now and then. So just before we go, uh, Christy, do you have anything new that you want to report on uh, the Christy Stratos world? <laughs> I have, yeah, one thing on my Patreon, which you can join for just a dollar a month. I have a brand new short story, which is called The Time Traveler's Truth, and that is historical fantasy. So it, it the main time period is the 1840s, um, but there is time travel involved. So this is kind of the beginning of my foray into historical fantasy. I'll be doing both historical fiction and some historical fantasy. Um, so definitely check that out. Like I said, just a dollar to join, just patreon.com slash Christy Stratus. That's my news for this week. How about you, Richard? I love the fact that you're getting into fantasy. I'm starting to wear off on you. Yes. <laughs> it's we'll, your get you writing, we'll get you writing about dragons real soon. Don't you worry. So, Victorian dragons. Yeah, Victorian, Victorian dragons, yes, mm -hmm. with, with bonnets on, yeah. But, <laughs> so my news is uh, I was just thinking about this the other day that uh, I've got another audiobook that's uh, going to be produced by my amazing narrator, Mikhail Roberts, and I was just wondering when he was about to do it, and the same day, two days ago, he got a hold of me and said, yep, he's starting production on it. So he's three chapters into that, and it should be done. It's it's going to be about 600 pages, but he says he'll have it done by the end of the next month, which would be amazing. So I'm looking forward to editing that and then releasing that, the Bainbridge Companion novels. So that's that's about all that's new for me. I'm still editing my 600-page manuscript that's uh, releasing on June 15th. So I, I just have to finish the edits on that. So it's a little tight, but I think I'll get there. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it for me. So next week's guest is a poet, and this is gonna be different. I don't think we've had any poets on here yet. The Jamie first... Estrada is a poet, but um, if you're is it David Ellis? It's David Ellis. Yeah, no, I, I know we some of us do dabble in poetry, but I think David is a, a more full fledged poet, if that's a proper way to say it. Right. He's an award winning uh, author of poetry, creative marketing, workbooks, journals, humorous fiction, and musical lyrics. And he's also the co author and co founder of the inspirational poetry magazine. Auroras and Blossoms Poetry Journal. So that should be a great show. And until next week, uh, for Christy and myself, uh, we hope everyone stays safe and take good care. Good night.